Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have to dive into your holy word. We pray that you will give us wisdom and understanding. You will speak to our hearts and minds, Father, as we look into this important message. Lord, help us to examine ourselves to see if we're really of the faith, lest we be reprobate. Please, Father, speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. May the Holy Spirit be with us, remove every distraction. In Jesus' name, amen. The message is entitled, Eating and Drinking with the Drunken. Eating and Drinking with the Drunken. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Looking at verse 42 through 44, and we have it, please say amen. Matthew 24, looking at verses 42 through 44. Matthew 24, looking at verses 42 through 44. What are we called to do in preparation for Christ's soon return? The answer is given to us in Matthew 24, looking at verses 42 through 44. The Bible says this is what we're called to do in preparation for the soon return of Jesus. The Bible says, watch what everybody watch, watch therefore, for you know not the day, you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But this know that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. So if you're not watching, guess what? The thief will come in at night and take you unawares. So in the natural, so in the spiritual. If we're not watching, we will not be prepared for the soon return of Jesus. Verse 44, therefore be ye also what? Ready for in such an hour as ye what? Think not the Son of Man cometh. God calls us to watch. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What are we watching, brothers and sisters? God is calling us to watch you. Watch yourself. Watch lest you fall or enter into temptation. Watch lest some word that you shouldn't say come out of your mouth. Watch what you eat. Watch what you buy at the grocery store and that what you put in your cart and place in your refrigerator. Watch, watch, be careful what you view on the television screen. Watch, be careful what you put on your ears to listen to. So God is calling us to do, brothers and sisters. Yes, we ought to watch the signs of the times, but many of us know the signs of the times, but we don't have a connection with Jesus. Watching signs is not enough. First Thessalonians chapter five, looking at verse one. We have it. Please say amen. First Thessalonians chapter five, looking at verse one. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a what? Thief in the night. For when they shall say what? Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them and travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Is that saying Christ is going to appear back as a thief, just going to sneak up and just snatch people away? No, the Bible makes it very clear. He cometh in the clouds and every eye shall see him. Our Lord shall come. He shall not keep silent. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain. So we caught up together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is not talking about him literally coming as a thief. This is talking about his coming, taking you by surprise. When you wake up in the morning and find somebody breaking your house, you weren't expecting that. You're like, hello, where's my, where's my couch? Where's my VCR? Where's my... What's my television? You didn't explain. You didn't plan for that thief to come in your house and take your stuff. 
He took you by surprise. You weren't expecting that. That's how the coming of Christ will be. For those who are not watching and praying, it's going to take them by surprise. Verse four. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of what? Darkness. Therefore, let us not what? Sleep as do others, but let us what? Watch and be sober. God calls us to watch. He calls us to be sober. We got to be sober and be vigilant in these last days, brothers and sisters. Because our adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion walking about seeking who you may devour. If you're not watching, if you're not praying, he'll sneak up on you. Very serious. We're called to watch. Go to Mark 13, verse 33. Mark 13, verse 33. The Bible says, when you have it, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, take ye heed, watch and what? Pray, for you know not when the time is. What time? The time of the return of Jesus. You don't know the day. You don't know the hour. That's why we're called to watch. And if you're not watching, his coming will take you by surprise. Go to back to Matthew chapter 24. We're going back to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to begin at verse 45. Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 45. What does Christ call those who are watching and working? What does Christ call those who are watching and working? Go to Matthew chapter 24, looking at verse 45. When you have it, please say amen. Matthew 24, looking at verse 45. The Bible, the Bible says, who then is a faithful and what? Wise, Wise servant. What does he call those who are watching and praying? They're faithful and what? Wise. Jesus says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom the Lord have made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Bless is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so what? Doing. Very last say unto you, he sh that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So those who are watching and working, God calls them Faithful and wise servants. Are you a faithful and wise servant this morning? From the pastor on down, are you a faithful and wise servant? Are we faithful, wise servants? That's what we have to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters. So I'm, I have to, I'm a watchman, so I have to be a faithful and wise servant. That's automatic. But we all have to be faithful and wise servants. We all are called to watch. Amen. But the Bible says, blessed is he whom the Lord shall find doing. Doing what? We know he's watching. What else is he doing? Go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, looking at verse 37. We have it, please say amen. Luke 12, looking at verse 37. Luke chapter 12, looking at verse 37. We have it, please say amen. Luke 12, verse 37, going all the way to verse 40. The Bible says, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find what? Watching. Watching. There it is from the Bible. Amen. Because we already looked at Matthew's account. She said, blessed is that servant whom the Lord shall find doing. Here it says, what is he doing? He's watching. The Bible goes on to say, very I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make him sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. I like how you can compare both of these gospels together. Matthew said Christ will give him meat in due season. Luke says, yeah, he's going to give him meat, but he's going to gird himself and serve him. Amen. Amen. Do you want to be served by Jesus to sit at that table? And eat of that food that's going to be prepared for you. It's going to be better than any food you ever tasted here on this earth. And Jesus himself is going to gird himself. And he's going to serve you. Wait a minute, Jesus, what are you doing? I'm supposed to be serving you. No, 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 no. I'm going to serve you. The Bible goes on to say this. Verse 38, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. So regardless of what time or what season, all these servants are what? Watching. Mm -hmm. Verse 39, and this know that if the good man of the house had made known 
had known rather what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. Verse 40, be ye therefore ready. Be what? Ready. Also for the son of man cometh at an hour when ye think not. So God calls us to watch. Those who are watching, they are faithful and wise servants. Amen. Amen. Now what happens if the servant does not watch? We're going to Matthew chapter 24 again. Let's see what the Bible says here. What happens if that servant is not watching? Matthew 24, looking at verse 48 through 51. When you have it, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, But and if that evil servant shall say in his what? Heart. heart. Notice that. Say in his heart. He's not saying it audibly. Audibly, he's saying, Jesus is coming soon. But in his heart, he really don't believe it. And by his actions, he's doing things that are contrary to what's coming out of his mouth. Listen, verse 48. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to what? Smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the what? Drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says, my Lord, the life is coming in his heart. It reveals that something is wrong with him spiritually. He's saying out of his mouth. Obviously, the Bible implies that he's saying out of his mouth, the Lord is coming. But in his heart, he says, my Lord, the life is coming. You notice that? Because it says he said in his heart. It didn't say he said it out of his mouth. He said in his heart, my Lord, the Lord is his coming. And so regardless of what he says out of his mouth, by his actions, he shows that he don't believe in the coming of Jesus. Something is spiritually wrong. Go to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4, looking at verse 23. Are you that wise and faithful a servant? Or are you an evil servant? That's the question this morning. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Regardless of what come out of our mouths, it doesn't matter if our heart is far from God. With their mouths, God said, they do honor me, but their heart is far from me. That's that evil servant. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Amen. Amen. Keep thy heart, thy what? Another word for heart, this word heart means mind, your mind. Amen. Keep thy heart or mind with all diligence, for out of it are the what? Issues of life. So what's in your heart will determine what you do. It determines what you say also, but a lot of times we can try to cover up what we want to say. But in our heart, it's embedded and it comes out in our actions. Matthew 12, verse 35. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35. We have it. Please say amen. Matthew chapter 12, looking at verse 35. The Bible says a good man out of the good treasure of the heart, bringing forth good things. Amen. amen. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his, of his heart, bringing forth what? Evil things. So if there's evil in your heart, you're going to bring forth evil. If there's good in your heart, you're going to bring forth good. A good tree does not bring forth good, does not bring forth bad fruit. A bad tree does not bring forth good fruit. A good tree will bring forth good fruit. A bad tree will bring forth bad fruit. You never go into a pear tree and see it produce oranges. A pear tree is going to produce pears. An apple tree is going to produce an apple. An orange tree is going to produce an orange. Whatever, whatever is in the heart is going to come out. Amen. Amen. Go to Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11. We have it. Please say amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 looking at verse 11.
The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart, the what? Heart are the minds of the sons of men is fully set in them to do what? Evil. So the fact that the Bible calls this man, this servant, an evil servant reveals that there's something wrong with his heart because the Bible says in his heart, he said, my Lord, the life is coming. The evil servant. He is an evil servant because of what is in his heart. Yet he professes, notice, he professes to be serving God because he says, my Lord. But out of that same mouth, he says, uh, and it's, uh, out of his heart, rather, he says, my Lord delayeth his coming. This implies that he once believed in the soon coming of our Lord at one time, but as backslidden in his experience with God. Because what is he doing? Go to Matthew 24, looking at verse 48 and 49. Matthew 24, verse 48 and 49. He professes to be a servant of God, but in his heart, his heart is far from God. His, in his heart, he's not looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ because he says, my Lord delayed this coming. Out of his mouth, he may say something different, but in his heart, it's not with God. Even though he may profess to be a servant. And this is what he does. Matthew 24, looking at verse 48 through 49, it says, But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord, the lay of his coming, and shall begin to do what? Smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. What is he doing? He is persecuting his brethren. And what is he also doing? Eating and drinking with the drunken. We're going to break this down today. See, they persecute their fellow servants. Those servants who are proclaiming the soon return of Jesus Christ. Those who are proclaiming the present truth for the hour. They persecute them. They call them names. They call them all shoots. They call them fanatics. They call them extremists. While they claim to believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Listen, the name of this message is entitled Eating and Drinking with the Drunken. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Let me give you some encouraging words this morning. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. You know, the devil may try to tempt you to believe that you're doing something wrong, but you cannot listen to the voice of the enemy. Amen. You have to, we have to follow principle. We can't go by what we feel in these last days, brothers and sisters. Your feelings, your heart can be deceitful. Got to go by this right here. And sometimes I'm like, man, Lord. But it's what the Bible says. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. If you are preaching a message that is unpopular, expect persecution. Expect to be talked about. Expect not to be liked. Expect to be uh, pushed away from your brethren. The Bible says, blessed are they which are persecuted for what? Righteousness sake. Christ put that qualifying right there. Righteousness sake. See, if you're not doing right and things happen to you, that's the consequences of your action. But if you are doing right, you're doing what God says. God says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Do what? Rejoice. Did it say complain? Did it say murmur? Did it say? Did, no. It said what? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted the prophets which were before you. The prophets were persecuted. You look at ancient Israel, God's church anciently. You look at what happened. Isaiah prophesied and he spoke against the sins of Israel and called them to repentance. What had happened to Isaiah? The, you know, history reveals that Manasseh had him sawed in half. 
Jeremiah, what did they do to him? They threw him in some miry clay, some nasty, dirty mud. And it took somebody not of the faith, <laughs> somebody who was not a part of Israel to ask, tell the king, he's in there, he's going to take him out. And they get him out of there. These prophets were persecuted. They, they didn't have no popular message. People today want to call themselves prophet. I'm prophetess. I'm prophet so-and-so. I'm, I'm prophet John Mark. These men, these men weren't asking to be in office. A lot of these prophets, they spoke what God told them to speak. And a lot of times it cost them their lives. Amen. It's a serious thing. Amen. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters. Second Timothy chapter three, looking at verse 12. Second Timothy chapter three, looking at verse 12. So if you are doing what God says, do if you are living righteously, expect persecution. Don't think you're going to get a, you just going to escape persecution. No, you got to go through it. But Jesus says, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The same Jesus that told Joshua that, that I will be with you. It's the same Jesus, the same yesterday, today and forever. We got to believe in his promises. Amen. Amen. Second Timothy, chapter three, verse 12. The Bible says, "Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax what? Worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But the Bible says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Expect persecution, brothers and sisters. It's going to happen. See, in James White, they, brothers and sisters, and I'm going to read a little pamphlet here from my Lord delayeth his coming. You know, at times I, I draw things from the pioneers. Amen? amen. But at the same time, my foundation is not on what they said. Because this same James, what I'm about to read to you, wrote in uh, uh, my little flock. Something I can't remember the name of the book. A voice. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the book. A message to the flock. And a lot of people put it on Ellen White that she wrote it, but he, it was really him that wrote it. Because I read a statement there and I was like, that don't sound like Ellen White. And I went and verified it. That was James White's words. And later, James White, he, he, he said a particular thing and he corrected it. Amen. He later corrected that view. So these are not bad men. And I, I use a lot of their material for resource. But I'm going to read this right here because it was a nice, powerful pamphlet that he did right here. My Lord delayeth his coming. Elder James S. White. And the reason I said those things, because you have some that say the pioneers, the pioneers, the pioneers. They put them on the same level as the Bible and spirit of prophecy. They're not on the same level on the, as the Bible and spirit of prophecy, brothers and sisters. Amen. They say they're pioneers, but they repeat the same mistakes of the pioneers. I'm moving on. My Lord, the life is coming by James White. This is what he said. An evil servant says in his heart, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord, the life is coming. Matthew 24, 48. The case of this evil servant has been supposed to apply to those religious teachers who entirely rejected and opposed the doctrine of the second advent as taught by William Miller and held by the advent body. It has been un unanimous, the unanimous opinion of those looking for the Lord's second coming that the prophetic discourse of Matthew 24 touches the important events with which the church of Christ is connected from the first advent down to the second First, the destruction of Jerusalem. Second, the 1260 prophetic days of tribulation to the church. Third, the signs of the second advent in the sun, moon and stars. And fourth, the two classes of servants, one giving meat in due season, the other smiting his fellow servant. This position in the main is, an, is certainly correct, but it is a painful fact that a large portion of the advent people and advent ministers have lost their faith in the soon coming of the Lord. 
That was back then. Do we see that today? Absolutely. They may still cherish the doctrine of Christ's personal advent, the literal resurrection of the just prior to the millennium and the true inheritance of the saints. But faith in the immediate coming of the day of God, they have lost the past advent movement. They consider a mistake one after another of the pillars of the advent faith. They have pulled down. Do we see that today? That was back then. But do we see that to say today, brothers and sisters? Absolutely. This apostasy has been a gradual deceptive work so gradual and so carefully managed by the Advent papers that the brethren who have lost their faith can hardly tell how and where they lost it. Yet it is gone. That's my Lord delay if it's coming. Page 12. It goes on to say for several years, these unfaithful servants have been saying in their hearts, my Lord delay if it's coming as their acts have denied their profession of faith in his immediate coming. And they have been overturning one strong point after another of the original Advent faith. They have continued their profession of faith in the immediate Advent of Christ while their acts, their what? have shown that they were saying in their hearts, my Lord, the life is coming. More recently, however, they have been speaking it out in unmistakable terms under the head of the original Advent faith. The Advent Harbinger for December 24th says, this is an article that he's quoting from from years back. Two prominent items of this faith were the darkening of the sun in A.D. 1780 as fulfillment of Matthew 24, 29, and the connection of the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 with the 20 hundred days of Daniel 8. In answering L.T. Cunningham's inquiries re relative to the connection of the 70 weeks with the 20 hundred days, Ms. Mr. Bliss remarks, this is taking us to page 13 of this book now. We argued their connection as evidence that the longer period would expire in 1843-1844. If those periods commence at a coming epoch, it can no more be denied that the longer one ended at the time named that the sun, than the, that the sun rose this morning. But the event predicted to follow at the end, not having transpired, it follows that the supposition of their connection was an error. The passing of 10 years has demonstrated it, the 70 weeks period was not cut off from the 2300 days, and therefore the supposition that it was has been disproved as sophistical by the abandonment of this last item of the original advent faith its fundamental principle is given up were we told by sister white that the fundamental principles of our faith will be given up interesting for the connection of these two periods for the connection of these two periods was the distinguishing point between Mr. Miller's faith and the, that entertained by other common theories on the prophetic periods and the abandonment of the dark day in 1780 as a sign of the Lord's near coming. We also consider a wide departure from the original Advent faith. We hope the Herald will continue its departures from the original Advent faith until it shall be freed from error and become a herald and defender of the whole truth. Amen. As the harbinger has renounced the Advent faith, why should it longer profess to be the Advent harbinger? Why not take some appropriate name and not profess to be what it is not? Its readers were once Advent believers. Has their faith been gradually taken from them in the downward course of the harbinger so that they have not strength to resist the temptation to renounce the faith altogether? We fear for many. May God have mercy and save the sincere. That, that's taking us to page 14 now of the same book. The Advent Herald has taken a fearful position relative to the 2300 days and the doctrine of Daniel. Daniel chapter eight and Daniel chapter nine. The asser, assertion that the passing of the 10 years has demonstrated that the 70 weeks was not cut off from the 2300 days is untrue and presumptuous. It could be shown if could be if it could be shown that the sanctuary is the earth and that its cleansing is the burning of the earth, then the earth's assertion might be correct. But as the sanctuary is the true tabernacle of God in heaven, the passion of 10 years demonstrates no such thing. 
it has led us to search and see that the oversight was in the event to occur at the end of the days and not in the time. I'll stop right there. That was taking us from my Lord delay of his coming page 12 all the way to verse all the way to page number 14. So James White had to deal with individuals who were giving up the Advent faith while still professing to be Adventist. They still profess to believe in the coming of Christ, but they rejected key points of the message, like the 20 during the days and other things like that. And we see the same thing today. We are told that the fundamental principles of our faith will be given up. That a new organization will be established, that books of a new order will be written, but they still call themselves Adventists. The Bible says by their fruit, she shall what? Know. know them. It's not by the name, but by the fruit can we determine the character of the tree. Amen. Now, what does it mean to eat and drink with the drunken? Revelation 14, verse eight, the Bible says, go to Revelation chapter 14, verse eight. Let's move on here. Revelation chapter 14, verse eight. I just want to share that little uh, piece there from James White. Because he had to deal with those things in his time. And we see the same thing being repeated today. Revelation chapter 14, verse eight. Amen. amen. And there followed another angel saying Babylon is what? Fallen, Fallen is what? Fallen. Fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the what? Wine of the wrath of her fornication, eating and drinking with the drunken. What does this mean? Go to Revelation 17. Revelation 17. Let's see who this Babylon is. Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. When you have it, please say amen. amen. Now, we've been through this already in our last day events. But we're going to see what the Bible says just to review once again. Revelation chapter 17, starting at verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vows, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now we know a woman in Bible prophecy represents a what? Church, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Amen? And that these many waters, the Bible reveals to us in Revelation 17, verse 15, that there are many multitudes, nations, tongues, and people. So this woman is sitting on many waters, meaning she is ruling over the people. How is she able to rule over the people? Verse two and verse three. We'll look at it. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk. They have been made what? Drunk with the what? Wine of her fornication. Verse three. How is she able to rule over the people? Verse three. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness and I saw a woman sit. What, was she, what did she do? Sit on a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. How is she able to rule over the people? This church is able to rule over the people by sitting on the beast. A beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom or nation. So we see a union of church and state united to rule over the people, to enforce her decrees and sustain her institutions. It happened during the dark ages. It's going to be repeated again. Are you ready for it? If you are an evil servant in your heart, you're not ready for it. But if you are a faithful and wise servant, you will be ready. The Bible goes on to say in verse four, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Verse five, here it is. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of what? Harless and the abominations of the earth. This is talking about a fallen church, Babylon, an apostate religion. Babylon is made up of three parts, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 16, let's skip over, let's go back to Revelation chapter 16 since we're close by. Revelation chapter 16, starting at verse 13. Amen? Amen. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the what? Dragon. Out of the mouth of the what? Beast. And what else? And out of the mouth of the what? False prophet, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather into the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So we see devils coming out of all three, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Three devils dressed up three different ways. Verse 19, the Bible says this. And the great city was divided up into how many parts? Three parts. 
and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. We've been through this before, just kind of reviewing a little bit. So we see the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, the Babylonian trinity, the dragon pointing to paganism, the beast pointing to Roman Catholicism and the false prophet pointing to apostate Protestantism. Amen. This is Babylon. Great Controversy, page 588, paragraph one. Through the two great eras, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions while the former lays the foundation of spiritualism. The latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States, here's your apostate Protestants, will be the foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism, which we will call paganism, because paganism is, 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 is a lot of spiritualism in it. And they will reach over the abyss to clasp their hands with the Roman power. We see three right there, right? And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling the rights of conscience. What is the wine that many are drunk with? The Bible says, talking about it, going back to that parable in Matthew 24, that this evil servant said in his heart, my Lord, the life is coming. And he began to smite his fellow servants. Why would you smite your fellow servant while you claim to profess the, the same truth that he is, believes in? The reason why is because they are eating and drinking with the drunken. What is this wine? Go to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, verses 7 through 10. We have it, please say amen. Are we understanding everything so far? Yes. Isaiah 28, verses 7 through 10. The Bible says, Isaiah 28, verses 1 through 10. 7 through 10, excuse me. But they also have air through what? Wine. And through what? Strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through what? Strong drink. The preachers have erred through strong drink. Now, literal rhyme clogs the judgment, right? So does spiritual wine. Pure wine refreshes. That wine that comes out of that grape, new, fresh wine, it is refreshing. There are two types of wine in the Bible, fermented and unfermented wine. That wine that Jesus made at the feast was not fermented wine. Amen. Amen. Solomon says in Proverbs that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And whosoever drinketh and is deceived thereby is not wise. So it's not talking about. So when Christ made this, this particular wine at the feast, it was not impure wine. It was unfermented pure wine. Amen. That comes out of the cluster. Sweet, refreshing. Just the same wine that Paul told Timothy, drink that for your stomach. He didn't tell him to take a bottle of, uh, of uh, Grey Goose and sip it, and that's going to help his stomach. Last I checked, and I, and I was out there in this, in this world, brothers and sisters, and I did things that I shouldn't have done. And last I checked, Grey Goose and Patron did not help my stomach. It made me sick. But grape juice, those things... I remember having uh, uh, my stomach felt kind of funny. I drank some grape juice. It helped my stomach. That's the wine that the Bible says that we should drink, not fermented wine. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I'm bringing out this right here in I Isaiah 28. Because it talks about the, 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 the prophets and priests have erred through wine to bring out the spiritual wine. Amen. Amen. It says the priests and the prophet have gone they have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. Verse seven, they err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Why? Because they are intoxicated with this fermented wine. Amen. Verse eight, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. Now, they don't look like there's something good for you right there, brothers and sisters. The whole table filled. You imagine somebody just intoxicated. Oh, and throw up all over the table. It looked like there's something wrong with his stomach. Am I telling the truth? So why would Paul tell Timothy, drink this for your stomach? He's not talking about fermented wine, but unfermented wine. Amen. 
Bible goes on to say this, verse 9. We're identifying what this wine represents. Here it is. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand what? Doctrine. Then we had a wean from the milk and drawn from the breast. So this wine that Babylon is making individuals drink out of what individuals are sipping on is false doctrine, false teachings, such as purgatory, eternally burning hell that's taking place right now, the immortality of the soul, that when you die, you go straight to heaven or hell, and other erroneous views. It's the wine of Babylon. It's the wine of Babylon. Impure wine represents false doctrines. Sweet wine points to true doctrine. Amen. Amen. Why are they? Why, why would they smite their fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken? All teachings not matching up with God's word is false doctrine. It's the wine of Babylon. The evil servant smites his fellow servants because he is eating and drinking with the drunken. He is involved in an ecumenical alliance with Babylon. And then at the same time, smites his fellow servants. It ain't no urgency in this. Stop talking about the Pope like that. But you're meeting with the Pope. You're taking pictures with the Pope. You're a part of an ecumenical movement. And the world sees it and they call it just the way it is. Eating and drinking with the drunkard. Is that why we don't hear the message like we should anymore? Is that why the trumpet is now muffled and it's not giving a certain sound anymore? Because preachers are eating and drinking with the drunken. Is that why we don't hear the spirit of prophecy anymore? Is that why we don't, we, the, the, the preachers, they just mm, and, ah, and hoop and holler and jump up and down trying to preach like T.D. Jakes? Because they're eating and drinking with the drunkard. Is it any wonder that we see preachers who should know, it, know better what, what we believe as a people and they stand up and start speaking in tongues? Eating and drinking with the drunkard. I don't have to call no names. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Let's move on. But that's not the only thing. It's not just... Sipping the wine of apostate Protestants and sipping the wine of Roman Catholicism is sipping the wine of the world, sipping the wine of the dragon. Satan's worldly culture. It's amazing to me, brothers and sisters, I saw this clip of Pharrell Williams and he had on his shirt Sunday. And he had this beast, this this crazy looking beast on the screen at this concert of here. And he was just, he was, he was just doing his little thing. And the people, they were just artists like, I'm like, I looked at their faces and I'm like, man, y'all under a spell, snap out of it. The Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, first John chapter two, are we listening to the music of the world? If you're listening to the music of the world, you are an evil servant. First John two verses 15 to 17. Love not the world. These are the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It is not of the father, but is of the what? World and the world passes away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abide it forever. So not enough. It's not just uh, listening to false teachings that makes you an evil servant by eating and drinking with the drunkard is also loving the world and the things of the world. And I'm like, man, why this preacher ain't preaching present the truth? Then I go on his Facebook and I see why. Mm. I see why. Because you rooting on Steph Curry and Golden State Warriors. Mm. No wonder you can't preach the message and give the trumpet a certain sound. Because you're caught up in the NFL and the NBA. Notice, brothers, so let me read this from Great Controversy, page 608. Great Controversy, page 608. You still love me? Yeah. I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth. I am not going to stand up here and muffle the trumpet. I worked too hard and I studied too hard and I prayed too hard for this message. And I'm going to preach it anyway, anyhow. Amen. Because I love you. Amen. Come on, Great Controversy, page 608. 
as the storm approaches, a large class who profess faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and they join, they join the ranks of the opposition. Why? By uniting with the world, uniting with the who? And partaking of his spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy and popular side. We got to cut off the things of the world in our lives, brothers and sisters. It's so very important. Jesus is soon to come. Marie Desire of Ages, page 635, paragraph one. Desire of Ages, page 635, paragraph one. We get to the closing part of this message here. The evil servant says in his heart, my Lord, delay is coming. He does not say that Christ will not come. Notice. He does not scoff at the idea of his second coming. But in his heart and by his actions and words. He declares that the Lord's coming is delayed. He banishes from the minds of others the conviction that the Lord is coming quickly. His influence leads men to presumptuous, careless delay. They are confirmed in their worldliness and stupor. Earthly passions, corrupt thoughts take possession of the mind. The evil servant eats and drinks with the drunken, unites with the world in pleasure seeking. He smites his fellow servants, accusing and condemning those who are faithful to their master. He mingles with the world. He grows with like in transgression. It is a fearful assimilation. With the world he has taken in the snare, the Lord of that servant shall come in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. But it's not just worldliness. It's not just false doctrine and false teachings. But it's also found in Luke 21, verse 34. Let's go there. Luke 21, verse 34. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. It's also in the lesson we talked about it. And I find it amazing that the lesson is just lining right up what we're talking about right now. I find that very amazing. God is trying to call us up higher in reform, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, Luke 21, 34, and take heed to yourselves. Let's at any time. What time? Any time. Your hearts be overcharged with what? Surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that that day come upon you unaware. So many are eating and drinking with the drunkards, literally by eating and drinking the wrong things. Intemperate eating and drinking and eating and drinking the wrong thing. Child guidance, page 404, paragraph three. Child guidance, page 404, paragraph three. If the stomach is not properly cared for, the formation of an upright moral character will be hindered. The brain and nerves are in sympathy with the stomach. Erroneous eating and drinking result in erroneous thinking and acting. So what you eat affects the mind. It's very serious. The nerves of the brain are in sympathy with the stomach. And read you this right here. Councils on diets and foods. Page 382, paragraph one. Councils on Diets and Foods, page 382, paragraph one. And this is for those who have come across the truth. And we know that health reform is progressive. Amen? Amen. Some people say that statement just to stay where they are. But it's progressive. Amen. So as God calls you up to come higher, you are to come higher. Amen? Amen. This, is, this is who this is talking about right here. Just want to put that disclaimer out right there. Councils of Diets and Foods, page 382, paragraph one. Greater reform should be seen among the people who claim to be looking for the second appearing or the soon appearing of Christ. Health reform is to do among our people a work which it is not yet done. There are those who ought to be awake to the danger of meat eating, who are still eating the flesh of animals, thus endangering the physical, mental and spiritual health. Many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no more with them. God is calling us to go back to that Eden diet from the very beginning. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something. Won't be no KFC in heaven. Won't be no Popeyes in heaven. 
So if you're loving those Popeye biscuits now, and that is your idol, you won't see it in heaven. It's not going to be there. It's not going to be no killers. It's not going to be no slaughterhouses. The lion and the lamb shall lie down together. Amen. Amen. It's not going to be no, the, the, the wolf and the calf shall lie down together. It's not going to be any killing. You're not going to be having a fishing rod and like, man, I want some fish. Oh, I caught a bass. You're not going to be up in there in heaven doing that. So for those of us who have come across this truth on health reform, this is who I'm really addressing here. Those of us who have, who pro profess advanced truth, who profess to be going all the way with God. God is calling us to come up higher on this point. Amen. Amen. Now, what I just read is not for everybody. Amen. Amen. I want to make that very clear. But for those of us who have who, who have been in this truth for some time now, God is calling us to come up higher. The reason why so, so many there are so many church trials and people snapping at each other is because of what's in their refrigerator. And you know I'm telling the truth. Getting all nasty. Well, if you would have did this, then what you getting all mad at me for? A lot of church trials are the result of what is in the refrigerator. What's in what you place in the stomach affects the mind. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Think about it, brothers and sisters. If I open up a can of whiskey and drink it, it's going to have an effect on my mind. So it's true. We got to look at what's in our refrigerator, brothers and sisters. What's in your refrigerator? What's in your refrigerator? Do you have turkey slices in your refrigerator? Making you a turkey sandwich? You have converted on this self reform message? You will walk away from God's people if you don't put that thing away from you. Now, the Bible gives us guidelines on how we ought to eat the flesh meat anyway. But we're coming at the time as God's people and God has given us a, a message. And because of the disease and animals, because of the wickedness of men, God has called us to come up high on this message. Matthew 24. You still love me? You going to throw it away when you get home? Now, when you go home. And you go home and eat it. After hearing this message, it's on you. If you get home and get sick. And have a stroke and fall over in your chair, it's on you. You've been warned. What's done in the dark will be revealed. You may try to be at home trying to sneak and eat it. And I, and like you, you, you eating just like you, you eating, you, you eating a plant based, like you act like you plant based while you're here. But when you're home, you, you eat opposite. Going to pull someone out of town to try to get something from KFC. God watching you. I'm serious, brothers and sisters. Some ministers are preaching, standing for the pool pitch and even be paid with the tithe because they still got the chicken bone in their mouth. And only by the mercy of God that they don't die with that bone in their mouth. Let me move on past that point. Go back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And like I said, these things that I'm saying, not for everybody. I would stand before unbelie unbelievers and others who are just coming to this, coming strong like this. I have to gradually teach them these things. Amen. Amen. But for most of us in this room, we should we already should know these things. Matthew 24, looking at verse 50. Matthew 24, looking at verse 50. There are many who, the world is coming up to par and they're starting to learn, man, let's start making vegan burgers and different things. See, that's becoming more open to this. But God's people had it for so long. We're trying to walk away from it. Many are walking away from it and the world like, man, Celebrities like I'm gonna go vegan for a whole year. We had this message for a long time, brothers. If we would have 
if we would do what God has told us to do, we would be the head and not the tail. Amen. Matthew 24, verses 50 through 51. What will be the fate of the evil servant? Matthew 24, 50 through 51. And the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. His portion with the hypocrites. Why? Because he was an actor. He's just a stage player. He came to church. They came to church like they were really holy and, and they were serving God. But in their hearts and secretly in their home, they were doing vice. They were caught up in vices and things that they should not be caught up in. God is calling us to come up higher, brothers and sisters. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. How does God feel about those who are backslidden from him? We're getting ready to close. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Starting at verse 38. Amen. Amen. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, backslide. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. God has no pleasure in those who backslide. What is God calling us to do? Go to Jeremiah chapter three. Jeremiah chapter three. I'm going to read two more texts and we're going to close. Jeremiah chapter three. Then we'll look at Isaiah. Jeremiah chapter three. Are you eating and drinking with the drunken? That's the question. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter three, looking at verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. For I am what? Merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Go, skip on down to verse 22. He says it again. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. And Jeremiah says, the, it says this. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the God, the Lord our God. God is calling us to return from our backslidings, brothers and sisters. That evil servant said in his heart, my Lord, delay of his coming because he backslidden from the truth. Have you backslidden in your experience? If you have, it's not too late to come back. It's not too late to pick up right where you left off. The devil wants you to keep sliding back, slide back. Go ahead. It's all right. Man, they don't care about you. Keep sliding back. No, don't slide back. God said return backsliding children. God says, as I live, I have no pleasure to death for the wicked. I'm calling you to turn from your evil ways and live. The reason why God has, has, has held back his coming and delayed it for so long is because he has no pleasure in those who perish. His long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Isaiah chapter one, looking at verse four as we close. Isaiah chapter one, starting at verse four. The Bible says, ah, sinful nation. A people laden, loaded down with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. They backslidden. Verse five. Why should ye be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and petrifying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Skip on down to verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts and the delight not in the blood of bullocks or of the lambs or the he goats. Will you come to appear before me who have required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. 
you claim to be serving me, God says. You claim to be doing my will. But in the dark, in the secret of your home, you're doing abominations. You're doing sin. You're doing things you shouldn't be doing. But you come to the house of God. Saying, I love you, Lord. God is appealing to us like he did ancient Israel. He says, and when you, verse 15, and when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Now, this is not saying those who are, who may be, uh, who may have fallen into sin, that God won't hear your prayer. It's about those who willfully choose to sin. Who willfully have in their mind, I'm going to do what I want to do, and you're going to pray to God. It ain't talking about those who, who may have fallen off the wayside and you praying to God and asking for help. They ain't talking about that. Amen. Amen. So about people who are rebellious. Are you rebellious this morning? Verse 16. And even with the rebellious, God shows mercy. Amen. So if he's able with the rebellious to show mercy, what can he do for you? Amen. Verse 16. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And then he lets out a cry in verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Amen. Have you been an unfaithful servant? It's not too late. You can today walk out of here and be a faithful servant. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You're saying, Lord, I want to be a faithful servant. I have been unfaithful, but today I choose to be faithful. And Lord, you're saying, Lord, I don't have the power in of myself to do it, but I'm asking you to work in me both to will and to do of your good pleasure. If that is your desire to today, say today that I'm going to be a faithful servant through the power of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, stand to your feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every, nobody has a heaven and hell to put you in. But you're saying today, I choose to be a faithful servant. God loves us so much. And he would not have went on such an expensive mission to save us if he did not love us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through Christ, might be saved.